Uvalde, Pulse, Aurora, Sandy Hook, Las Vegas, Virginia Tech, Columbine. The list goes on and on. The United States has many problems, but one of its biggest problems is guns. We live in a country where the right to own a gun, whether it's a pistol or a military grade rifle, is a right that shall not be infringed or stripped away. You are entitled to a gun as much as you are entitled to speak freely or practice your religion. The gun problem in this country has gotten out of hand. There's no denying that. But how did we get here? Is this a new phenomenon? The short answer is no. But it's not completely for the reasons that you think. But I'm getting ahead of myself. To truly understand how we got here, we have to start at the beginning. And it all started with the Second Amendment. I'm Andre, and this is the Redacted History Podcast. A well-regulated militia, necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 27 words, 142 characters. That's the Second Amendment, arguably the most divisive and polarizing amendment established in the country's original Bill of Rights that was drafted over 230 years ago, as America's founding fathers were lifting themselves up from under the grip of the British. Yay, freedom! Ironically enough, as they were leaving their oppressor, they were simultaneously oppressing a whole other race of people, African people, by the way of the transatlantic slave trade. It was about property and money. Most modern day Americans view the Second Amendment as a symbol of their freedom to carry firearms, big or small. Defend yourself, defend your homes. That's what the founding fathers intended when they ratified this amendment in 1791, right? Sort of. In order to truly understand the Second Amendment, why it was created, and who it was created for, remember that. You have to put some context behind it. Nuance is everything. From the moment that the first African Americans arrived on the shores of what would become the United States of America in 1619, they resented their bondage. Who wouldn't? And they resented that bondage before they even arrived here. They were treated like cattle on their treacherous and inhumane journey during the Middle Passage in the transatlantic slave trade. They resented their bondage and the white man in charge of them and the country knew this. The people leading the country knew this. That's also very important. Everyone knew this. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. And every slave owner and overseer in the country knew this. During the Second Continental Congress, which was a meeting between delegates from the 13 colonies between 1775 and 1781, there was much discussion about the fact that the fight against the British was not going to be cheap. Especially seeing as that if they wanted to really hit the British hard, there would have to be a fleet and naval defenses built to go up against the infamous Royal Fleet of the British. So there was a plan proposed where there would be a wartime taxation plan in order to fund the fight. There were 2.5 million people all together in the 13 colonies. So each respective colony would pay based on their population. Easy, right? Easy math. No. The southern states opposed this plan, seeing as how their populations at the time were majority enslaved people. South Carolina objected the loudest. They said this taxation rationale was faulty. How could they tax based on slaves when slaves weren't people? The North wasn't counting their sheep as people, so why should the South count theirs? Crazy quote. That's a crazy thing to say. And Benjamin Franklin famously said, there was some difference between slaves and sheep, as sheep would never make a revolution. They could pretend that the enslaved people weren't people all they wanted, but the truth of the matter was simple. They were people. People who resented their chains, and an uprising could happen any day now. The southern colonies, where slavery was objectively more brutal and inhumane, had spent a good portion of the 17th and 18th centuries putting measures in place to mitigate and stop slave rebellions before they could even start. Virginia, for instance, had measures in place that denied black people the right to bear arms, the right to defend themselves, and they put in place a large-scale militia to put down any uprisings. And Virginians prohibited black people from carrying firearms as early as 1613. 
Even with all of these preventative measures, Virginia still experienced insurrection scares in 1687, 1709, 1710, 1722, and 1730. South Carolina had similar measures, yet they were too rocked by possible insurrections, and they actually had one that actually happened. And this one scared every single white man in all 13 colonies. In September 1739, 20 enslaved men from South Carolina were working on a labor gang building roads near the Stono River. And these men were plotting patiently. Each day while working, the men would survey the area and the overseers. Where would people go every day? From which road? How long did it take for certain folks to get from point A to point B? Where were the weapons stored? What was the terrain like? After a while, they felt they had all the intel they needed and it was time to strike. On Sunday, September 9th, 1739, the men stormed the weapons storehouse, decapitated two white clerks, and took the weapons for themselves. The men then marched through the colony, getting other people to join them. What was a band of 20 men turned to 90 and they marched through the South Carolina colony towards Florida, where the Spanish militia ruled that escaped slaves were free once they crossed the river. They could not let these enslaved escapees reach Florida. That would be their worst fear. These slaves could rise up, kill white men, then take their freedom into their own hands? No. Poppycock. That could not happen. It took them a year, but the South Carolina militia eventually overwhelmed the rebels. But it was now time to set an example. They took about 50 of the rebels alive and they were shot, hanged, and gibbeted. Some of them also had their heads cut off, which were then hung on posts miles apart to show other slaves what their fate would be should they get the idea to ever rise up. The Stono Rebellion would live in the minds of white people for the next half century, validating their fears that the slaves could one day rise up and take their freedoms back through any means necessary. The Constitutional Convention took place from May 25th to September 17th, 1787, and the intention of many of the people there, including James Madison, who would go on to be the fourth president, was to create a new frame of government and fix the existing one. And as important as drafting a new government was, the idea of slavery and potential slave uprisings was like the elephant in the room. One, because as previously mentioned, these white men were terrified. And by the time of this convention in 1787, many of the Northern states had changed their outlooks and views on slavery completely. Massachusetts had eliminated slavery altogether and Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania had instituted sunset clauses in their states. But the Southern states, of course, had differing opinions. South Carolina was actually looking at replacing a lot of the enslaved people who had either died or liberated themselves during the Revolutionary War. One of South Carolina's first governors, Rowland Lowndes, said, Negroes are our wealth. The Northerners were there to create a viable and sustainable nation, and the Southerners were there to improve and strengthen the institution of slavery, which would be a precursor to the Second Amendment's creation. The South was at the table with a list of demands. They wanted the North to make no impediment on the slave trade's existence. And South Carolina was doing a complete 180, saying that the enslaved population should count for their state's headcounts for legality reasons. The South wanted the power to call on the militia to expel slave insurrections and uprisings. Patrick Henry, a Virginia war hero and nemesis of the man drafting the Constitution, James Madison, also argued that the federal government was fixing to have the power to call on a state's militia during wartime. And he was worried that during times that the militia was gone, there would be no one there to protect the people from the slaves. And then, what would keep a Congress dominated by Northerners from refusing to protect Southern slave states from slave uprisings? And the Southerners would eventually convince or I like to say force James Madison to draft a Bill of Rights. The Southerners wanted James Madison to incorporate language into the Bill of Rights that would allow the militias to operate as a slave control device. And without that promise, the Southern states would be out. So the Second Amendment by and large started out as a bribe, a bribe steeped in anti-blackness and white supremacy. James Madison, a slave owner himself, of over a hundred black bodies in his lifetime was not subscribing to the ferocity in which the Southern states were acting in the hopes to protect the precious institution of slavery. But Madison knew that if there were to be a nation worth living in, he'd have to give in to the South's wanting to be protected from slave revolts. 
James Madison's first draft of the Second Amendment read like this. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, but no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. There was, of course, massive pushback on this draft because some thought the language around the militia was far too vague. And thus, the Second Amendment as we know it was redrafted, modified, and polished, as was the rest of the Bill of Rights, which James Madison whittled down from 17 to the 10 that we know today. Historian Michael Waldman points out that while the other amendments point forward, the Second Amendment definitely points backwards. Pay close attention to the language of the amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Paying attention to the language, you have to understand that this was all for the right of people who were considered people to be able to keep and bear arms and that right shall not be infringed. This amendment was never written with black people in mind. I'm not saying get rid of the Second Amendment. I'm not saying get rid of people's rights to bear arms. What I am saying is that how can we today in 2023 with good conscience live by laws that were written by racist enslavers without black people or any minority in mind? And that includes women. If we say that we are true denouncers of racism, bigotry, xenophobia, and slavery, then we have to be able to critically look at laws that were written in times, in times where the people in charge did not denounce these things. Second Amendment was ratified on December 15th, 1791. Second Amendment was merely a precursor to Congress and American lawmakers continued their effort in subjugating and restricting rights from the enslaved. The Second Amendment set a dangerous precedent that would lead to more laws whose sole actions were to punch down even harder on enslaved people. There was the Naturalization Act of 1790, which was set in place to determine citizenship in the United States and who could be a citizen. Of course, the law stated that a citizen could only be a free white person. The Virginia Court of Appeals even made a ruling in 1806 that if a person appears to be a Negro, then that person is presumed to be a slave. Among a long list of racist laws that were meant to curtail the rights of black people. And like I said, the Second Amendment was merely a precursor to maintain control and stop uprising. And what's the easiest way to uprise? If you have a gun. The Second Amendment wasn't created for Americans to be able to have guns and protect themselves for the sake of protecting themselves. It was created so that the southern states could be appeased. So that the white men and the aristocracy didn't have to look over their shoulder. So I leave you with this. Do we really want to govern ourselves by a law that was written 230 years ago by possibly the most evil men to ever rule the country? I'll let you answer that for yourselves. Until next time. What are your true thoughts on the Second Amendment now that you have a little bit more added context and nuance? Drop those in the comment section below. Today's video, once again, was not sponsored by a company. Rather, it was sponsored by, by my lovely, caring patrons over at Patreon. If you like what I do here at the Redacted History Podcast, whether it be on social media, YouTube, or the actual podcast, consider giving a few coins to the Patreon. You can find that linked in the description below. And remember to like and subscribe. Stay a while.